good friends, welcome this morning. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to this time of worship. We've come to meet God, to spend time with God in this place, to worship fully and truly, to give thanks for all of the blessings of this day and every day. Let us worship together. Let us worship together. Join me now as we begin with our call to worship. The Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Will you please stand for our first hymn? seated. We'll look just for a moment at our announcements this morning. As I said earlier to someone, we paid somebody a lot of money to fix that. <laughs> it was supposed to be all done, <laughs> but something's going on up there that's still beyond our realm. 
Um, you, so the first thing I want to call your attention to is another reminder of um, the meeting on the 31st with uh, Reverend Caldwell and our youth director, Katie Borum. This is going to be to talk about some really wonderful new things that are happening. Chase uh, talked with you a bit about them yes, or last week, last Sunday. Um, we are going to... Um, enjoy something very unusual and beautiful for these children coming up in the months ahead. Please, uh, families, notice that date and try to be present for this. Important, too, the luncheon that was scheduled during our sort of blackout week last week. We missed half the week because of ice last week. Uh, notice that the, the luncheon has been rescheduled for this coming Wednesday, the 24th, and the same wonderful program is expected. That's from Dr. Jay Fitch, who will uh, give a, a program at the luncheon that day. Read all the announcements and take part as you are able. All of the words in the uh, announcement section of the bulletin are important for you to see and to share with others. Let us enter into a time of confession so that we might confess our sins to God, trusting in his forgiveness. O oh, loving God, to turn away from you is to fall, to turn toward you is to rise, and to stand before you is to abide forever. Grant us, dear God, in all our duties your help, in all our uncertainties your guidance, in all our dangers your protection, and in all our sorrows your peace. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor together. God of glory, you have given us Jesus Christ, your Son, to be the light of our lives and the light of the world. Forgive us when we turn away from the brightness of his love and instead embrace sin and pride. In your mercy, cleanse us of our sin. Forgive us and renew us and equip us to shine forth as your lights in the world through Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, who declared to us that God's kingdom has come near, we know that there is no escape from God's love, not even in the depths of our sin and brokenness. Know that by the power of Christ and in the reality of his kingdom, you are forgiven. Let us stand and give glory to God. As those who have been forgiven and who have received grace upon grace from our merciful and loving God, let us not hesitate to share that same love, forgiveness, and grace with one another. The peace of Christ be with all of you today. And also with you. Take a moment to share that peace with one another.
Good morning. Hey. It's so good to see all of you. A couple of you are, are new faces to me. I'm uh, Pastor Chase. I'm associate pastor here along with Pastor Joan. So I have a, I have a question for you, and, and this requires that you, be, that you would have been observant people. And I, I think that you are observant people. What is on top of this building back there? You can't see it from here, but if you were looking outside at the top of this building, what would you see? A crack? I sure hope not. Someone might want to observe that. Right at the front, you even can see it if you're far away from this building. It's a big thing. There is a cross, I think, maybe. There's a weather vane, I know. There's something, something not so far from the top, a big round thing. could be that. There's a clock. Have you seen the clock? There's a big clock on front of our church, and inside of that tower where the clock is, there are things that make noise. Do you know what that is? There, there's a bell. That's right. Now, why would a church like ours have a clock and bells? It marks the half hour and the hour. You're right. Why would a church have a clock? And bells. So people know when church is starting, it does do that. If I'm over at my office and I uh, let time get carried away from me, I'll hear a large dong that will remind me it's time for me to get where I need to go or get over here. But one of the reasons a church like ours has clocks and other churches have clocks is because God has time for us. And when Jesus started his ministry, when Jesus began to preach and began to do what he was going to do, Jesus said, the time is here. God's time is here. It's time for God to do what God has always wanted to do with us. And as followers of Jesus, we live on God's time. And that means that time is very important. I don't see any of you with a watch. Maybe some of you are not quite old enough to have a phone. But you need to know the time, not just so that you'll get up and go to school at about 8 o'clock or whenever it is that you go to school, or not just so that you'll be here at 1030 when church starts, but so that you know each moment of your life is important. It's important to God every minute, every second, every hour, every day, every week, because it's all part of God's plan. It's all part of God's kingdom coming alive in you and Jesus doing what Jesus wants to do with you. And so this week, I want you, every time you see a clock, every time you hear a phone go off or an alarm go off that tells you it's the next hour or it's time for something, remember that we live on God's time. And how we use that time is really, really important. So let's stand and have a prayer together. Dear God, thank you for time. Thank you for days. Thank you for moments. Help us to use the time you have given us to love and serve you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. A reading from Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three, <clears throat> a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh 
shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. A reading from Psalms. For God alone my soul waits in silence, and my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. O oh God, rest my deliverance and my honor. My, <clears throat> my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate, but, but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. <clears throat> Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken twice, have I heard this? That power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord. For you repay to all according to their work. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short from, from now on. Let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the word as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you please stand for our second hymn? Thank you. 
be seated. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Lord, come and call us once again. Give us ears to hear you and hearts to believe and obey. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Right now, at this very moment, before the next tick of your watch or the next spark of your phone that says another second has passed, With each breath that you take, before you can even blink, all at once, the world is changing around you. So much change is happening that it is almost overwhelming. In the next minute, somewhere on this planet, hopefully not here, lightning will strike around 300 times in the next minute. There will be five earthquakes in the next minute. 250 babies will be born and over 100 people will die. In your body at this very second, if you're still with us, over 1 billion chemical reactions are taking place in each of your 37 trillion cells. 2 billion red blood cells are dying Don't worry, they're being replaced almost instantly. And 20 billion messages are being sent between the neurons in your brain, probably less if you've dozed off. In the time it takes me to finish this sentence, the ball that we call the Earth just covered over 100 miles of our trip around the sun and our solar system, Earth and Moon and Sun, Mars and Jupiter, the whole thing has traveled 1,000 miles through our galaxy. Think about that too long and you'll need a couple of tabs of Dramamine. All at once, literally, everything and everyone is constantly and fantastically changing. Our world is coming undone and a new one is on the way, already here. That's more or less what I think Jesus meant with those earth-shattering, life-altering words that we heard in Mark 1, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. All at once, everything is about to change, and all at once you've got to change too. But of course, this change Jesus is speaking about, the change that Jesus made the central focus of his ministry and his preaching, this change is even more dizzying and breathtaking than all those stats I mentioned. God's reign over the world is beginning. God's dream for the world is starting to come true. To very loosely paraphrase Matthew's version of these words, God's heaven is coming down to our earth. The kingdom of God has come near. It's just outside the door, you could say. So close you can reach out and touch it. What does that mean? By the end of this first chapter, Jesus will give us a pretty good idea. In a synagogue... 
the first century Jewish equivalent of a church where Jesus' teaching is interrupted by a demon-possessed man, we learn that the kingdom of God is a place where God's voice is heard and where the good news frees the spirits of those who are bound and broken. At Simon's house where his mother-in-law is dying of a fever and then outside where the whole village lines up desperate for their chance to be cured, God's reign looks like healing for people distressed and diseased in body, mind, and soul. By the end of the chapter, chapter, we see God's dream coming true as compassion moves Jesus to reach out and touch an untouchable person and restore them. God's kingdom has come near. Jesus isn't talking about some faraway place only, some far off time, a never, never land, a pie in the sky that you can visit when you die. God's reign, God's heaven, God's dream starts here and now. When Jesus shows up all at once, our world starts to change. What does that mean for us? Mark gives us a picture of what it means to repent and believe this good news of the kingdom come in the calling stories of those first four disciples, two pairs of sibling fishermen, Simon and Andrew, James and John. When Jesus comes calling and the kingdom comes near to them in their boats, Simon and Andrew leave their nets and the catch of the day right there in the lake and immediately begin to follow. In one moment, James and John drop their life's work and seemingly their family ties in the boat with their father, leaving the family business to the hired hands. When Jesus calls all at once, get ready, because lives are changing. So what about it? Have you become a disciple like that? Is your life, is my life, marked by that kind of all-at-once change? Can you point to the place and time, or the places and times, where you heard the good news? Where Jesus said, follow me, and you left whatever it was behind all at once and went with him. Jesus' invitation, Jesus' command to us is just as simple and total as it was for those fishermen and fools there on the lake. It doesn't need much translation. Follow me, he says. So what about it? Have you met Jesus and gone with him? To use the most traditional term for this thing, have you been converted which is just a $10 word for have you turned to Jesus? Now I know I'm making you nervous. We Presbyterians like to think about discipleship in terms of process and orderly development. We don't usually do altar calls and revivals, and I'm not trying to start one. We're far more likely to sing day by day, by day, by day with Richard of Chichester than we are to sing I Saw the Light with Hank Williams. We like to think of our faith as less of a one-time, 180-degree turn absolute decision and more like an ongoing journey, a lifelong journey. But all journeys have a beginning, don't they? Like any good chemical reaction, and I know we have some folks who would know far more about that here than me, but from what I know, all processes require a catalytic moment, a jumping off point, as someone in our Sunday school class recently remarked. There was the buildup to that one uncovered pipe in my yard that burst on Tuesday from the shoddy plumbing that someone did years ago to my neglecting to cover it to the hours of arctic temperature seeping through thin, aging, exposed PVC valves. There was that process, but then came the moment 
when all at once there was a beautiful new 15-foot water feature in my yard cascading across the grass. If you've been listening by now, someone ought to have made a bingo in their bulletin for all the times I've overused the phrase, all at once. But you can blame Mark. Because Mark sprinkles this word immediately, liberally, throughout his gospel. Forty-one times, in fact, including eleven here in this first chapter. Mark tags that word immediately, or all at once, onto the leaving and following of these four fishermen because he wants us to hear something urgently important about Jesus. Jesus doesn't simply preach radical, earth-shaking, life-altering change. Jesus is that change. To be in the presence of Jesus is to be transformed from life before God's kingdom to life lived evermore for God's kingdom. To hear. To actually hear the word of Jesus means already to begin to believe and obey the good news. We hear of no introduction, no prep work, no lead up to Jesus meeting these four four people. How is it that with no explanation, without even a sales pitch or a sermon, without even giving them a few good reasons why, they go off and follow this man? Fourth century church father and translator of the Bible, Jerome, said there must have been something divine they could see in his face that they couldn't resist. Mark doesn't mention anything like that. Jesus just shows up and people follow. It's just the reality within him of the kingdom. The power of his presence, the pull and tug of his person. Whether or not the evangelist believed something like the doctrine of irresistible grace, or whether he even knew or cared about how any of that works, Mark wants us to know that Jesus means and makes change. So what about it? Are you, am I, at this moment, a disciple? Are you currently being changed by Jesus? Are you at this second on your journey, on that journey where he is leading, are you currently living that life that is constantly and repeatedly leaving behind and that over and over again learns to believe and trust the good news? What's the use of beginning a journey and then not continuing on towards the destination? What good is a singular moment of faith in the past? A dramatic conversion even, however poignant and clear, without keeping on in your faith today and then tomorrow. Whether you can mark the day of your baptism or your confirmation or the first time you darkened these doors here, whether you can tell us the day and the time that you saw the light, Are you still being converted and turned day by day by day? Does Jesus still meet you? And do you still choose all at once, all over again to go with him? I can tell you that I'm not sure when I became a follower of Jesus. Even as a Baptist, I couldn't pinpoint the moment of my conversion. Maybe that's part of why I wound up here. (laughs) But I can remember the moment, the night, that I became a dad. It was about a week before Karis was born. Mom and Dad had come to visit us for Thanksgiving in North Carolina. And they stayed that Saturday night to watch the LSU game with us. LSU and Texas A&M, 2018, which became an infamous game for LSU fans, record-setting in college football. The thing went to about 11.30 after it started at 6. Seven 
overtimes. Broke the combined score record of a college football game in any division. And LSU lost. And there were some not-so-fair reasons I thought that they lost. And it was one of those things that you were going to still be thinking about it a few days later. And I just could not sleep. I knew I had church the next day. I knew it was going to be a busy week with a, a penultimate week uh, visit to the uh, OBGYN's office. And so I tried to sleep, but the game kept replaying in my head. And I figured at about 2 o'clock that I wasn't getting anywhere here in the bed stewing over this silly football game. It was time to get to work. There were things to do across the street at the church from our parsonage to prepare for the Sunday service. And there were some preparations to make before Karis would come. Some furniture that needed to be put together, some ducks that needed to be placed in a row. And at that moment, maybe for the first time in my life, my discomfort and my need for sleep or whatever else I realized wasn't as important as the other people who I was kind of responsible for. Now, a lot of you figured that out a lot earlier than me at 29, but hey, at least I got there. So I went across the street, printed bulletins, did all my Sunday morning things, went over my sermon, made some edits. That day came and went, and then that week we found out at that penultimate OBGYN visit that it actually was the visit and it was time to go to the hospital. Her pregnancy was induced. And my life as a dad began ever since. That was my moment of conversion from whatever semi-adolescent kid I was to a dad. But there were many more moments on that journey. The moment she did all those firsts, like talk or walk. The moment I first went camping with her. The moment I laid next to her in a hospital and worried that she might not make it. The moment that we moved here and she actually became a part of her grandparents' lives. All the moments that happen every day with her. I began to change and Karis keeps changing me. That's what a relationship is, isn't it? That's what it means to know Jesus, I think. Maybe there is a beginning point, however dramatic or undramatic it might have been for you. Maybe today might be that beginning point for you. But to follow Jesus is to have many more moments of meeting him all at once and all over again. To be continually and constantly and completely changed again and again. Today is one of those moments. Goodness knows not because of my words, but because of God's word and God's presence among us. This is one of those days. There is something new and different that God wants you to take from this place to begin or to continue or to change or to leave behind. To paraphrase Paul, God would have you continue from this place to leave behind the present form of your world and begin to live to the one God will make as he makes all things new. And there will be many more each day, each moment as Jesus meets you, not only in this place, not only when you're ready for Jesus to meet you, but always Jesus meeting you, calling you, speaking to you, touching you. So as the psalmist writes, may you go from this place constantly waiting on the God who is always coming to meet us in Jesus Christ. This is the time. God's dream is coming true. God's heaven is coming down. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Lord, you change us, you call us, 
in ways that we cannot imagine and do not yet know. And yet, we learn to trust from the sound of your voice, from the look of your face, from the power of your presence, we learn to trust you and go with you and be changed by you however it is you would change us. Change us today more into people of your kingdom, people of healing and compassion and presence who live and speak your word Today, if there are any among us who this would be a beginning for them, help them all at once to go and follow you. And for all of us, help us again today and evermore to come with you all at once. Go with us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand now as we affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed as found in your bulletins together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we turn to pray, let us remember all of those names that are on our hearts, people whose illness or whose situation caused us to pray for them during the week. Let us remember to lift prayers for them as we pray together at this time. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, you are Father of all, our own heavenly Father, our rock and our redeemer. You sent Jesus to proclaim your kingdom. You sent him to teach with authority Anoint us with your spirit that we too may bring new, good news to the poor, that we may also bind up the brokenhearted, that we may also proclaim liberty to the captive. Accept us in your service, in your kingdom, as disciples who need your training. We pray today for your church in the wide world, help all who are in your church to proclaim your salvation as they work to conform your church to the cross of Christ. We pray for our own community and ask that you would teach us to love our neighbors, to serve one another with gladness and to seek the good of all people, not to seek only our own selfish desires. Strengthen families, we pray. Especially give strength to parents as they rear children to know security and joy and lead children to understand the blessedness of honoring their parents as they learn to honor and respect all people around them and to love and honor you. Many, O oh Lord, are in great need today in great need of your comforting, in great need of your love, your presence, your grace. Be present to all who are hurting, those who are weary and those who are carrying heavy burdens, those who are sick in mind, body, or spirit. Lift up those who are sad and depressed. Befriend those who grieve. Comfort the anxious 
Lord, guide the leaders of all nations of the world, including our own. Reconcile people who are estranged from one another and bring peace where there is turbulence. Let hearts that are broken mend and grow stronger. Lord, we ask all of these in the name of your Son. He has taught us to pray, and we turn to you, asking that you would hear us now as we pray these words together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us turn now to a time of thanksgiving as we bring our tithes, our offerings, and our gifts and do so in joy. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we give thanks for the gifts that you have given to us. You have generously poured blessings upon us, and we return some of those gifts and some of those blessings to you now. Help us to know how to use these gifts in ways that further the kingdom in this place according to your will for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing now for our final hymn.
May Christ send you from this place. May Christ go with you. And may Christ meet you at every step of the journey until we return once again. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.